I'm very partial to the Torah 101 podcast. I feel even though I've been blessed by the Almighty to have six different podcasts that I host, I think that perhaps my greatest contribution that I was fortunate enough to do is the Torah 101 podcast. Because I feel this is like, this is an entire course. Nay, it's a multi-year course in in Torah philosophy. If you want to understand the Torah, you want to understand the philosophical components, the foundations, the fundamentals of our religion and our great gift, the Torah. This is the podcast view where it's all laid out, it's all organized, it's all sourced, and it's rigorously presented in this podcast. And I feel that those of us who were fortunate enough to go to yeshiva and we have a strong background in Torah, this is the one podcast that kind of puts it all together, that gives the listener a comprehensive view of the incredibly interesting and intricate elements of our religion and our Torah. And now, this week is the time for you to say, for you to vote, for you to demonstrate that you believe that this podcast, the Torah 101 podcast, it's worthy of your support. You see, we're hosting the annual Torch fundraiser right now. And that's happening online, givetorch.org. The link is in the description of the podcast. And each one of my six podcast shows, they have their own team, their own page. And the Torah 101 podcast, it has some donors, and it's raised a little bit of money towards its goal, but it still needs a little boost. So maybe, if you're interested, maybe I could recommend, I could propose that you you hit pause on the podcast, and you look in the description, you scroll down, or you swipe until you see the description of the podcast, and you click the link. And that will bring you to the Torah 101 podcast page of the Torch fundraiser. And you will have the opportunity to gaze at the page and to see the various donations. And maybe, just maybe, you would want to join the group of people who say that this podcast, Torah 101, is worthy of your support. We are so fortunate to have the Almighty's Torah. And we're so fortunate here at at Torch to be able to to dedicate our lives to spreading the Almighty's Torah. And I think Torah 101 of this incredible podcast, it's a wonderful achievement, and I would love nothing more than having you show your support. You can make a donation. Every donation is doubled. This is the only fundraiser in 2024. Again, click the link, givetorch.org, support the great... Torch Center in Houston, Texas, and of course, the great podcast, Torah 101. And as always, my email address is rabbiwolpe at gmail.com. In the previous episode, we highlighted the point of resurrection. Resurrection is principle number 13 of Rambam's 13 principles of faith. The dead will come alive yet again. And last time we talked about the goal, the point of resurrection. And that we said is to prepare a person for a sort of living that matches, that mirrors, that resembles the life of Adam and Eve before their sin. In our world, people are created in a different fashion, in a different format than Adam and Eve were created. In our world, people are created out of fluid, the Talmud tells us. Adam and Eve were created out of dust. The daughter of Caesar compares the creation of humanity today to building out of water, out of fluid, versus the resurrection, which will be out of dust. And we understand that, that that is, it's not just a different way to build the same thing. It's a way to create humanity in a way that resembles Adam. And we spoke about the loose bone, this one bone somewhere along the spine. That's the starting point. 
That's the part of the body that was not affected by the sin of Adam. When Adam sinned, he condemned humanity to die. But there was one part of him that did not sin, and therefore still exists in the paradigm, in the format of Adam pre-sin, and that is the beachhead for pre-sin living. That's the part of man that's not subject to dying, and that's the point where resurrection begins. And we are recreated as Adam. And just as Adam had to arrive at Shabbos, day seven, without sinning, we get a second chance, a second shot at it, to arrive at Shabbos, not day seven, but millennium seven, with pristine perfection, and thereby to be able to enjoy the Shabbos, which we call Olam Abba, the eternal world where man is able to experience, man as in mankind, is able to bask in the divine glory. That's what we covered last time. And today I want to further expand the subject and to explore the nature of this resurrection as best as we understand it. Of course, if it goes back to Adam and Eve, we have to understand Adam and Eve before their sin and Adam and Eve after their sin. And there's a very important distinction that's very relevant to our study. There's a distinction between Adam and Eve the way they existed before their sin and afterwards. Before their sin, they were a hybrid, a mashup, a fusion of body and soul. After their sin, they were also a hybrid, a fusion, a mixture of body and soul. Adam was a body and soul before and after the sin. But there's a tremendous difference between the relationship and the hierarchy of body and soul from before the sin to after the sin. It was a radical shift in the nature and the relationship between body and soul from before the sin to afterwards. We know this is something we've discussed in the past. It's featured in all the sources. That the sin caused the arrival, or really more precisely, the integration of the Yetzirah, of the evil inclination within the body of humanity. What does the Yetzirah do? What is the primary function of the evil inclination? It's to change, to alter the perception of body versus soul. Body and soul can be viewed in very radically different ways. It's possible for a person to identify as a soul. You are a soul. Oh, souls just need garments. They need some sort of enclosure. They need some sort of vessel to be placed in. But the vessel, the enclosure, the body, it's very secondary. It's just something that you need. It's just something you need to, to, to deploy, to, to use, to effectuate the desires of the soul. It's possible to view the body as just a garment for the soul. That's the way things were before the sin. The Yetzirah changes this. It flips it on its head. Instead of viewing the, viewing the body as a garment for the soul, the function of the Eight Sahara is to take the body and to make it a person's essence. And to make a person ignore and not see and not perceive and not sense their soul. Before the sin, Adam and Eve were souls. They happened to have had a body, but that's kind of a remote afterthought. It's like a an abstract concept. It's like an idea. Yeah, it's, it's something which, which is even debatable. Like, do you have a body? I don't know. It doesn't, do you see it? Is, is it important? Is it salient? Does it germane in any way? It's not. After the sin, the respective realities of body and soul are flipped. Everyone thinks of themselves as a body. 
And do you have a soul? I don't know. It's kind of like a remote afterthought. It's like a distant idea. It's an abstract concept. You could even debate whether we even have a soul. The reality, the relationship between body and soul were flipped. Adam had his body and soul before and after the sin. But before the sin, he identified exclusively as a soul. He sensed exclusively the senses of the soul. What was visceral, what was real, what mattered, their identity, their essence was the soul. And the body, it's something which they ignored. Today, we live in a very different paradigm. What do we identify with viscerally? What do we sense? Our perception of pain and pleasure is exclusively oriented around the body and not the soul. That is the primary byproduct of Adam and Eve's sin. In the garden, before the sin, they had a body, but they were not even aware of its presence. The verse tells us they were naked and were not ashamed. That's the verse's way of telling us the body it wasn't didn't capture any part of their mind share. The body was just like a garment. And if your garment is unclothed, it doesn't bother you at all. It's just the garment. None of us are embarrassed that our garments are unclothed. Unless, of course, our kids are mortified by the style choices that we make. Oh, you got to cover up that sweater. But the garment, it's just the garment. It doesn't bother us if our garment is unclothed. Just as a person is unashamed, if their sweater, if their cardigan, if their trousers are unclothed, that's not who you are. As long as your essence is protected, you're fine. Adam and Eve were unashamed that their body was unclothed because that was not who they were. That's not how they view themselves. Before Adam's sin, he had tremendously lofty stature. The Midrash tells us that the angels, the angels, they mistook Adam for God. And they wanted to bow down to him. They wanted to worship Adam. The angels, which are, are, are total spiritual beings, they viewed Adam as, 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 as so superior to them spiritually that they thought that Adam was God. Adam, before his sin, was not animalistic at all. Yes, he had a body. But notwithstanding the fact that he had a body, he was not physical in identity, in essence, at all. In the words of Scripture, Adam was one notch below God. The verse tells us. And the angels, as lofty and as spiritually ethereal as they are, they couldn't discern the difference between God and Adam. That's how lofty Adam was. In the words of the Talmud, it just uses superlative words. Adam spanned the world over. He saw from one end of the world to the other. He had unfathomable lofty stature. We cannot even begin to comprehend the loftiness of Adam before his sin. Yes, he had a body, but it's a complete non-factor compared to his eminently lofty and dominant soul. But Adam sinned, and he was severely diminished. And now the the angels ridicule him. Ma enosh tisistirena. Why does humanity even matter? How are they actually different than animals? Before their sin, the, the, the soul was dominant. After the sin, the animal side of Adam, the body side of Adam, became as completely dominant over him as the soul previously was dominant before the sin. 
before the sin, Adam was a soul. Yes, there's also a body, but it's it wasn't identifiable, wasn't discernible by any of the parties involved. Post sin, the respective identities are flipped. The person became a body. And is the soul there? It's it's kind of indiscernible to all parties. Before the sin, the body's like a, a theoretical abstract idea. After the sin, the soul is now theoretical. The soul is now an abstract idea. First thing that happens after the sin is they recognize they're naked and they're trying to get clothed. And ultimately, God clothes them with leather garments. Why are they concerned about their body? Because now they notice it. Now this is who they are. And that's the primary difference between Adam pre and Adam post. How they view the respective realities of body and soul. And this distinction is very important for us. We established that resurrection is to change us in a way that's more resembling of Adam before his sin. Once we understand the nature of Adam's sin and the change, we can understand the reversal of that. And it will, of course, show us what we need to do or what role we play in trying to achieve this. The most definitive source in Scripture on resurrection, we saw already this this verse in Daniel several times, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. It talks about those who are sleeping in the ground, they will arise, they will awaken. These for eternal life and these for eternal ignominy. There is a process of reemergence, of waking up, of climbing out of your graves. But some people go in one direction, eternal life, and some people go in a very different direction. Now, the sources have told us that this rebirth is akin to the sprouting of a seed that was buried, that was planted in the ground. You recall the conversation that happened between Rabbi Meir and Cleopatra. When they emerge, will they emerge clothed or naked? And the response was an analogy, a metaphor of The wheat, you plant the wheat in the ground and it emerges from the ground. And we deduced from this that the emergence in resurrection, that's the same way that you plant the seed in the ground and it emerges when it blossoms. But some people will head in one direction, eternal life. And others will head in a very different direction, eternal ignominy. What determines if someone is in the first category or the second? So this is the perhaps the most important point. The ultimate goal, and we repeat this again and again. The ultimate goal is what we call Olam Haba, the world to come. And that's the eternal pre-sin of Adam sort of life. What determines a person's suitability to be in the category of those who emerge for eternal life is what sort of seed was placed in the ground when they were buried slash planted. Over the course of a person's life, they make choices, all sorts of choices. And each choice changes them. And each choice changes what they are and what seed, so to speak, they become when they are planted, when they are buried. And the question is, the central question is, is the seed that goes into the ground, does it have within it the properties of eternal life or not? When someone makes choices to focus on their eternal half, on their soul, what do we call those choices? The choice is, when someone prioritizes their soul over their body, we call that a mitzvah. 
In effect, they are changing the seed that goes into the ground. They are crafting themselves into a seed of eternity. They are laying the ground for their candidacy for eternal life, to be part of the group that says, L'chaye olam, for eternal life, for the pre-sin of Adam life. When someone makes the opposite choice, they choose to neglect their soul and they reinforce the primacy of their body over their soul. They're also affecting the seed that will be planted. And when that emerges from the ground, it will lead to a very different fate and destiny than the righteous. There is a direct connection between the choices that we make in our lifetimes and the type of resurrection that we earn. The choice that we make in our lifetimes, that that molds the seed that's implanted into the ground at burial. And that seed is what blossoms with the resurrection. For the sinner, well, the seed will emerge for judgment of crimes and even potentially eternal ignominy. You recall the fascinating discussion between Robert Peter the Prince and Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. We cited it in the past. Antoninus comes over to the great rabbi and says, well, the body and soul can each exonerate themselves from judgment. The body says, well, the soul sinned. Look at me. I'm not capable of sinning after the soul departed from me. Soul makes a very similar argument. I'm not capable of sinning ever since the body departed from me. And therefore, each one of them is able to deflect the blame on the other. How can there be judgment for a person's crimes? So, Judah the Prince responded with the analogy of the blind guard and the lame guard tasked with watching and preserving the field for the king. And they conspire to sin, to eat all the delicious figs. And the king comes and says, well, what happened to my figs? I didn't do it. Look at me, I'm blind. I didn't do it. Look at me, I'm lame. The king, once again, reunites the two together as one and judges them as one. So too, in the future, says the Talmud, the Almighty takes the soul and casts it and throws it into the body and judges the person as one. When you read this Talmud, we have a description of resurrection. We have body and soul being fused together. But the Talmud is written with absolute stunning precision. The verse says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed is he, Mevi Neshama, takes the soul, Vizorka Baguf, and throws it into the body and judges them like one. This is a description of resurrection of the wicked. The soul is thrown. It's placed into the body. The idea of the paradigm of Adam Changing, that's not present over here. The paradigm of this world, of the world post-Adam's sin, it's still present. The soul is thrown into the body. Yes, the body is reanimated, but the soul is thrown in almost as an afterthought. The description of our life today, post the sin of Adam, it's like the body is the essence and the soul is kind of thrown in. You can miss it if you don't squint. That is what happens to the sinner. They haven't done anything to change, so to speak, the orientation of body versus soul, and they're they're reanimated and the soul soul is thrown back into the body. The body is reanimated, but this person is not a candidate for pre-sin of Adam life. Because the seed that they... Crafted in the lifetimes, it's just the same. It's the body's still dominant. The soul's thrown in. 
the definition of a righteous person is that they live a life with a concerted effort to change the relationship of body and soul and to render their soul as primary and their body as secondary. They're making choices to prioritize the soul over the body. They're making choices to take the agenda of the soul and make that their marching orders. And again, that's that's what a mitzvah is. A mitzvah is a choice to follow the agenda, to pursue the agenda of the soul over the agenda of the body. And this choice, well, that changes the person. And even in their lifetime, the change is perceptible. They're slowly reversing what Adam did. After Adam's sin, they were a body and the soul's an afterthought, but that can be changed. Once a person becomes righteous or begins to become righteous, there's a subtle shift. The agenda, the existence of the body begins to become a little bit less important. And they start to sense and perceive the feelings of the soul. And they're slowly reversing things. They're slowly pivoting back to the way things were. Now, to actually complete the journey, to completely change the breakdown of body and soul, and to render the body as insignificant compared to the soul, that's you know, that's done by only the absolute greats. Only the absolute greats complete the journey in its entirety. So we already saw Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are examples of people that were able to completely change and become the way Adam was before his sin. Moshe, of course, Aaron, David. We talked about the 10 who entered paradise alive. Maybe there are more as well. But that's not for the masses. We cannot realistically hope to actually completely change and become like Adam before his sin in our lifetimes. But we can and we ought to aspire to at least have a little bit of that, a little seed of that, a little kernel of that, a tiny little scintilla of that that can develop and sprout into something much greater with the resurrection. If you look at an apple seed, it's not an apple. It's not certainly a tree with a thousand apples, but it has a little bit of it within it. It has a little kernel of that within it. And you put it in the ground and it gets developed and developed and developed until it sprouts and it emerges and it develops into an apple tree. For us to become a tree, so to speak, of Adam before his Sin, that's not really what we can aspire to. Maybe you can, I can't. We're trying to create that seed. And that seed will be placed in the ground. And hidden from the view, from the purview of everyone, it begins to develop and take root and expand and germinate. And there's going to come a point in time when it's going to break through the surface. And even then, it's going to continue to grow. And there will be a point in time when the righteous who created that seed that was planted in the ground will have the full actualization of the potential in the seed. And that's what we call Olam Haba. And that is eminently doable and feasible. For everyone. There's a whole debate, a very vigorous debate amongst the great sages and commentaries as to the existence of the body in Olmaba. 
Do we have a body? Do we not have a body? There's a lot of literature. Again, the, this is literature written, written by the absolute giants. We already saw the Rambam in his epistle where he talks about that. But there's a lot more literature debating this question back and forth. And much of the evidence surrounds a citation in the Talmud regarding the differences between this world, Olam Hazeh, and next world, Olam Haba. In Olam Haba, the world to come, there is no eating, there's no drinking, there's no intercourse. Rather, it is the tzaddikim, the righteous, sitting with their crowns in their heads. Venehenim meziv hashchina, and they are basking in the pleasure of the divine. And we saw that uh, to see that, to perceive that, even the great prophets couldn't perceive that. It was like it's like looking at the sun. It's totally beyond us. When Moshe was transposed to that state, the people couldn't look at him. Moshe, after all, spent 40 days and 40 nights, three times actually, in heaven with no food, no water, no, no sleep. He became like Adam before his sin. And he was able to dominate the angels. And when he comes down, the people look at him and his face was glowing like the sun. He had to wear a mask. He had to create an artificial body. Moshe had changed the body and soul within him. He was a soul. And we couldn't perceive it. We couldn't look at him. He's glowing as brightly as the sun. And he had to place just an artificial mask, an artificial body, to spare us from this encounter with a human, but a pre sin of Adam version of the human. Just as Moshe did not eat nor drink for 40 days, nor sleep, in Olam Abba, people will have potentially a body, but they will not eat nor drink nor sleep. That's one opinion. Others argue that no, 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 no. For the fact that there's no eating, no drinking, no sleeping, in Olam Abba, it must be that there's no body. Because if there's no functions for the body, there cannot be a body. But regardless, whether you have a body or you don't have a body, the identity of a person, the essence of a person is the soul. If you have a body, it's a body in name only. So some say that there is a body, but it's like Moshe's body. Others say that there's no body because there's no functions of the body. But regardless, the soul in Olam Abba, in the world to come, is completely Dominant. And part of the way to prepare a person for Olam Abba, part of the stages where a person is made ready and compatible with that world, part of it is resurrection. And the Mishnah tells us, all of Israel, call Yisrael, they have a portion in Olam Haba. Because all of Israel is righteous. If Olam Abba is the life that mirrors Adam before his sin, there are very, very, very few people that can achieve that in their lifetimes. Moshe and the forefathers, very, very few people. But called Israel, all of Israel, they will merit that because to be eligible, you don't have to become a citizen of Olam Abba in this world, you have to become a seed, a kernel, a scintilla of that citizen in this world. The seed has the latent capacity for the future fruit when they blossom and fully manifest themselves. And there's a very big difference between the seed the apple seed, if you will, and the fully formed tree. But that's the goal. The goal is is that when you put the seed in the ground, when you bury a person, it's like putting a seed in the uterus, in the words of the Talmud. On one dimension, well, you have the potential there. But if you compare a, a zygote, To a fully formed baby, it's very, very different. Like the apple seed versus the tree. The zygote versus the baby. 
the righteous person, versus whatever emerges for Olam Abba with the resurrection. In the interim, after you put the seed into the place where the seed will develop, whether that be the grave or when you plant something, which is another version of another way to describe, so to speak, the grave, or the uterus in the words of the Talmud, there's a time where change happens and it's not seen by anyone. And there's you know, nine months of gestation and there's all sorts of development, development, development. You put the seed in the ground and it's developing and it's completely beyond the view of anyone. It's changing. A person is buried, is planted, there's development. Everything that happens to the person in heaven, in hell, in wherever they are, that's part of the development. If you look at the prayer that we mentioned in the past, the prayer about resurrection, Givuros, the second prayer of the Amidah, the second blessing of the Amidah, it has the words of resurrection, Mechayim Esim, five times. In four of them, it's in present tense. We think of resurrection as something which will happen in the future. The prayer tells us otherwise. Presently, there is a process of resurrection underway. Just like when you plant a seed in the ground, there is growth that's happening. You don't see it. It is beyond your perception. But it's happening even before it emerges from the ground. So too, all the righteous the righteous seeds, if you will, that are planted, they are undergoing a process of development and resurrection as we speak. There's all sorts of progress happening beneath the surface away from public view. And what emerges is very, very different than what went into the ground, just as an apple seed and an apple tree are very different, as a zygote and a baby are very different. And zooming out, this shows us what mitzvahs are really all about. You know, we think of mitzvahs as a good deed, as a way to improve the world, as a way to live a good life, and that's that's partially true. But it fails to note the primary goal of a mitzvah. The primary goal of a mitzvah is to reverse what Adam did. It's to move the person back to the way humanity was before the sin of Adam. It's a way to prioritize the soul over the body. To reposition the soul in the way it was before its grand demotion with Adam's sin. That is what mitzvahs are ultimately all about. And it, it is possible to do the entire journey in your lifetime. It's very, very unlikely, but it is possible. What is more likely is that the mitzvahs will mold the person into a seed, into a kernel of the Adam pre-sin perspective. And that seed, when placed, when buried, when planted in the ground, begins a process of sprouting. God is actively resurrecting the dead. And everything that happens is a process of developing and preparing for the dramatic re-emergence. And when it re-emerges, that seed comes to life in a very different way than when it went in and how it went in. The human, the righteous one that emerges, this is a candidate for the Adam before his sin paradigm. The body is now subservient to the soul. The wicked who didn't take the time and the effort to develop the seed that is a candidate for eternity the soul will be thrown to the body, all right. But what comes out? It looks exactly the way the way Adam looked after. 
his sin, maybe even worse, because it was further corrupted. That's not a candidate for eternal life. Now, again, it's not so clear exactly at what point in the whole process of preparing the soul for Olam Abba resurrection happens. To me, it seems that you know, just as when you have a baby, the baby's not ready for prime time, right? You put the seed in the ground, so to speak. You put the seed into the uterus and the baby comes out, but, well, he's now, he or she is now here, but this is not a fully formed human. You have 20 years still, that, you know, before they're an adult. 25 for the millennials, right? Maybe 30, I don't know. You plant the apple seed in the ground, it sprouts to the surface, you can't enjoy the fruits quite yet. It seems likely to me that resurrection is a certain stage in this preparation for Olam Abba. It's when it comes back to the surface. But at its core, we understand what needs to happen to become eligible, to become a candidate for Olam Abba. And that reveals to us the indispensable vitalness of mitzvahs. The only things that we can do, the only way of life that we can adopt that enables us to earn a seed that will sprout into the good sort of resurrection, the life that is suitable for Olam Abba, it's only with mitzvahs. I want to read you a few citations from my book, Upon a Ten-String Tarp. I have a few chapters in the book about this crossover to eternity, as it is called, this whole process of resurrection. So the first citation is the description of what we talked about, how resurrection is the rebuilding of man in a way that is ready for Olam Abba. Okay, here's a quote. In this context, resurrection refers to the reconstitution of man in the Olam Haba format. In this context, resurrection is not about throwing the soul back into the body and constructing the person in the format of this world, a soul submerged, drowning in a Yetzirah-dominated body. It's a total recreation of man, bringing to life a person whose soul now dominates his identity with the same suffocating iron grip that in our world, the body is man's identity. Restoring the equilibrium that existed prior to the soul being subjected to the Yetzer Hara. I enjoyed that citation. I figured I'd read it to you and I have a few more still. This tells us that the objective is to go back to Adam before his sin. And the means to do it are Torah and mitzvahs. Those are the ways that we change the seed that will go into the ground, that will be planted, that can have the capacity of emerging as a version of a human before Adam's sin. Torah and mitzvahs change a person, alter a person in the direction of man before the sin. And that changes the seed that gets planted, and the person that emerges for Olam Abba. A lot of people think that, well, uh, I'll do the mitzvahs because I'm doing God a favor, or my parents, or my rabbi a favor. This is the only way you can earn a ticket to eternity. And I'll tell you, this is largely what the whole book is about. You know, the subtitle of the book is how Torah and mitzvos prepare the soul for eternity. That's what the book is about. And for us, I think this whole discussion gives us hopefully a greater appreciation of the power and the vital necessity of mitzvos. Again, this is the only means by which we can earn a share of eternity. If the soul has not been elevated to some degree over the body in a person's lifetime. That's all part of the seed. 
and that emerges, the soul will yet be thrown into the body, cast into the body, but the body is still dominant. This is not a candidate for the life that existed before the sin of Adam. Okay, uh, one more citation from the book. When the Gaon of Vilna was on his deathbed, he seized his tzitzis and began weeping. In this world, he cried, for pennies, you can buy a pair of tzitzis and through it garner eternal reward. Once you leave this world, however, not all the money in the world can buy you a single mitzvah. Mitzvahs are the means to lock up a spot in Olam Abba. And in this world, they are shockingly cheap and accessible. For the limited time that our soul is harbored in the body, this is a, one of my favorite lines, we have access to a vending machine that dispenses diamonds for the price of soda cans. I like that. It's a good imagery. Yeah, you know, like to like put it, yeah, okay, put in some quarters and select. Oh, a diamond. Easy. That was easy. We are advised to make hay while the sun still shines, to grab as much as possible before time expires, and the golden opportunity vanishes. We have now a bit of a picture of the nature of the ultimate resurrection. Again, we're trying to come back to the way things were beforehand, and we need to do something to be a candidate for that. And we made choices that goes into the seed and that will emerge and develop and flower for the resurrection. But of course, our study is not yet complete. There are all sorts of unanswered questions. We still have the 10 dilemmas of Sa'ad Yirgoni that we mentioned very briefly in the past. The whole question of reincarnation, resurrection, what about the, the great day of judgment or the seventh millennium? There are many tantalizing subjects in the larger subject of resurrection, yet further to probe with y'all. And I'm looking forward to doing that from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback.